Okay, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Hannah Ishmael, who is the Collections and Research Manager at the Black Cultural Archives, which is an independent archive based in Brixton, South London. Hannah completed her PhD on the development of Black-led archives in London from the Department of Information Studies in UCL. Hannah will present as part of this um, the approaches of the Black Cultural Archives in dealing with questions of inclusion and diversity within the collections. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you, Jane, and thank you to um, RLUK for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to, as everyone says, I'm just going to start uh, to share my slides. Hopefully you can all see those. Um, so this is going to take a slight detour from what I suggested. So when Black Cultural Archives was approached to discuss our methods for decommunization in conversation with the broader efforts in the heritage sector, I took this as an opportunity to perhaps present something a little different and to pose the question to the extent to which the, center, to which the sector can be decolonized. This is an area of interest for me. Most of what I'm thinking about and proposing here are very much unfinished thoughts and works in progress. These are also my personal thoughts and, um, and not necessarily to be those taken um, as those of Black Cultural Archives, but very much in having come to them through working at, from, um, working at Black Cultural Archives. Also, depending on the time, on the day that you ask me this question, I may perhaps give a different answer. However, fundamentally, I am very cautious about the question of decolonization in the heritage sector, particularly as it relates to the English colonial context. In their article, Tuck and Yang argue that, quote, decolonization is not a metaphor. When metaphor invades decolonization, it kills the very possibility of decolonization. It recenters whiteness, it resettles theory, it extends the innocence to the settler, it entertains a settler future. Decolonize a verb and decolonization, a noun, cannot easily be grafted onto pre existing discourses and/or frameworks, even if they are critical, even if they are anti racist, even if they are justice frameworks. End quote. I want to make it clear that I am thinking about about the problems of using the term decolonization in a way that seeks to empty deco decolonial attempts of real grit and meaning, particularly if we attempt to interchange and decolonial activities and processes with words such as diversity, anti-racism, or other EDI initiatives. I'm also not dismissing any of these activities, but I want to outline the seriousness with which we must take decolonization and be ready for the wholesale destruction of almost everything we know. As JJ Gadar wrote in her article on, de on decolonization in the archive sector, we have a long way to go before we can quote, go beyond rhetoric to enact meaningful decolonization. And indeed we do have a long way to go. To begin with definitions, the term decolonization has two meanings. Firstly, the physical process of granting self-determination and independence to former colonies, often after armed rebellion from colonized peoples. And secondly, it's for our purposes to undo the effects of colonization. However, I also want to remind us of what Amy Césaire wrote, that colonization equals thingification. So we must also resist the temptation to think about colonization as a thing or a destination, but as a process and a framework. I think, I think it is vital that we begin the process, begin the process and understand the different frameworks within which we operate. But for the latter part of, part of my talk, I will be focusing on some of the major shifts we must engage with um, if we are to think and practice decol decol decoloniality. I also think that it's worth restating that decolonization efforts are very specific to the shape of colonization. What decolonization looks like in South Africa, Canada or, or, or Australia looks different due to the different historical processes and actors. So again, when we think about or talk about decolonization efforts here in the center of empire, we need to be very clear about what we mean. Whilst we can look at it to the activities and take inspiration from those struggles, we must resist importing them wholesale, as this once again leads us into the colonial logic of sameness. As Professor Hakim Adi also reminds us, um, it's sometimes worth bearing in mind that the act of and process of decolonization is something that should, should be undertaken by the colonial powers and not something that should necessarily rest with those who have been colonized. However, of course, there is crucial anti and decolonial activities and theorization taking place across the former empires of Western European states. So if decolonization efforts are to take place here, in many ways, it must be led by, by the colonial power and not left to those who are affected. I also need to make clear, clear that I'm talking about the practice and process of archival theory and the management of archives, 
rather than necessarily archives as material existing out in the world. And although the two are intertwined to such an extent that it's difficult to, uh, um, to untangle them. Returning to Tuck and Yang's description, again, description of decolonization, I am also reminded of Audre Lorde, particularly her often quoted, um, the, tool, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And I invoke this due to Lorde's work as a librarian and, and the added dimension that this brings to the, to the specificity of considering decolonial work within the archival and library spaces. Whilst I don't have time to, to necessarily delve into these, specific these specificities, it is, also, it, it is important to think about, the, about both archival practice and theory along the idea, alongside the ideas of houses and tools separately, but also fundamentally how the archival theories rest and function as both the master's tools and the master's house. Alongside Lord's work, I'm also reminded of houses and borders, and particularly Derrida's often cited description of the genealogy of the term archive in archive fever in which he discusses the nature of Freud's archive. In the opening of the text, Derrida writes, oops, oh, sneak preview. Um, the meaning, that quote, the meaning of archive is only meaning, comes to it from the Greek archaeon, initially a house, a domicile, an address, the re residence of the superior magistrates, the archons, those who commanded. The citizens who thus held and signified political power were considered to possess the right to make or represent the law. On account of their publicly recognized authority, it is at their home in that place, which is their house, private house, family home, or employee's house, that official documents are filed. Derrida opens his essay by bringing attention to the power dynamics inherent in archives, something which we have, I think, all mostly come to accept. But in the context of the colonial origins of our theories, the power is, is, is clearly vested in the colonial authorities. This opening quote also brings attention to the thorniness of thinking about decolonization in the sector as in many ways we cannot think outside of the archive and our theories. Derrida argues that the word archives themselves, the word archives itself also inhabits the idea of a commencement as material becomes archive once they pass the threshold and are transformed into archives by the act of passing the threshold and entering the house. As a deconstructionist, Derrida was interested in language and the power that language has in shaping our worlds and how we think about them. Derrida was also interested in literally deconstructing our language and associated discourses but, was, but, but also looked at how we are also imprisoned by said language. Most of Derrida's work was interested in the archive in some way or another, and he was particularly interested in how texts and the history of texts are bound up, in, bound up with one another, as a text contains its own history and are always in the process of being remade. Derrida argues that no text is ever fixed in time and that we as readers bring our own understandings to texts um, which are informed by our own understandings. In terms of how this affects archival science, this shifts the way we think about some of our core values, such as custody and ownership, the, the need to fix a record in time and raises questions about the nature of recordness and the value of authenticity and reliability. For archivists focusing on the importance of fixing records for evidential and legal pur purposes, this postmodern focus on slipperiness and change is one that cannot easily be rec reconciled and speaks to the nature of true de decolonial work. Returning briefly to Tuck and Yang, Derrida's work also provides an additional impetus for my argument that we need to be mindful of how we deploy the use and activities of decolonization and decolonial rhetoric if what we mean is, necessary, is, is diversity, equity, and or inclusion. True decolonial work would not only change the nature of who is allowed in and who represents archivists, it goes beyond diversity and challenges the very nature of the house itself. It is clear that underlying much of the discussions on archives and archival practice are the, is this continue and continuation and attempt to fix and solidify the nature of archives and history writing, particularly through the formalized training of archivists through the development of the masters in our development of um, courses such as the masters in archives at those at UCL, and particularly under the direction of Sir Hilary Jenkinson, renowned as the father of English archives. Hilary Jenkinson was born in South London and attended attended Dulwich College, a private school renowned as a pathway into Oxbridge, so Oxford and Cambridge, um, specifically with the intention for those to go into training into the civil service and necessarily into the colonial office. Whilst I was aware of Oxbridge as being one of the main routes into the colonial office, it never occurred to me that the idea of service in the colonial office was seen as an important career option from an early age. Jenkinson went on to work at the National Archives where he cut his teeth on dealing with the material that had been amassed at the then Public Record Office. Jenkinson used his experience to advocate for specific training in archives administrations. Previously, archivists were trained primarily as librarians first and um, in the library school founded at UCL in 1921. And then later to codify his thoughts, Jenkinson wrote one of the first textbooks in archival administration. 
What is key here, and by no means revelatory, is that much of Jenkinson's outlook on the development of archival theory is interwoven in both his training and operations in the civil service and, his, and the role of archives as part of the apparatus of governance. It is also telling that during the physical process of decolonization um, across the British Empire and the move to flag independence, there were several approaches to what to do with these vestiges of colonial rule within the archives. For some, the archives were forcibly removed by the British government, but for others, they were attacked and burned as during the 1922 Irish War for Independence. I've also been thinking a lot about the specific role of the development of Jenkinson Manual at the Department of Information Studies at UCL and UCL more broadly, particularly the development of library and archive practice and how it codifies the profession. In my research, my light research for this paper and to what is known as the world of UCL, I was also looking at the circulation of white supremacists and specifically eugenicist ideas through the role of Francis Galton. I've been thinking about this in terms of how knowledge was understood and codified in the beginning of the 20th century, particularly in terms of who gets to know and what they can know. Whilst I haven't found any specific connections between Galton and the development of library and archive science at UCL, I've also been thinking about the importance of space. In 1904, Galton created his own record office called the Eugenics Record Office um, on 88 Gower Street, which is now practically sited opposite the current Department of Information Studies, where he, Galton and others direct, dedicated their time to creating and storing records of genealogical and family trees of those he deemed to be su superior. For me, this brings attention to the role of networks and how the transfer of ideas are circulated and to borrow from Sarah Ahmed, how these ideas inhabit spaces and start to inform them. Whilst this may seem unscientific or perhaps unsubstantiated, I do think that these less tangible connections also make a big impact on structuring our practices and thought processes. As I will discuss later, the role of eugenics and the desire to record, catalogue and control is another key, another key aspect of colonial thinking that we still live with today. I've recently left the role as teaching fellow at UCR, working on a module called Record Keeping Professional, in which I spent time attempting to make and remake these boundaries about what a professional looks like, um, often against Jen Jenkinson's definitions of what makes a professional, what makes archival material archival, in which he was very clear that only administrative, administrative records and only records pre-1918 could properly qualify. The question, of what is our, of our, the question of what is archival clearly raises important questions about the nature of archival collecting that continues to question traditional archival assumption of value and the role of evidence within our theories and practices and as outlined undergirded through colonialism. It would be impossible to discuss the role of values and colonial logic within the broader heritage sector without a discussion on the role of whiteness in fundamentally framing these discussions. Within my research and within the archive sector specifically, whiteness relates not only to those who work within the sector, but also structures the approaches to the archive and the understanding of what archives are. So relating back to Derrida and his house and the kind of borders around that. In his work, archivist Mario H. Mario H. Ramirez um, argues that much of the archival community's response to broad discussions on social justice is in effect an attempt to secure the whiteness of the field and to maintain the status quo. Drawing on the discussions within archival theory and the role of presumed, presumed neutrality and objectivity, Ramirez highlights the ways in which whiteness is often viewed as an invisible signifier, taken for granted because the marker for what is normal or objective, particularly within the archival sector. As further highlighted in Stuart Hall's 1999 keynote speech, Whose Heritage? One of the great unspoken issues around diversity and the practice of diversifying the sector is that, quote, by and large, this process has so far stopped short of the frontier defined by that great unspoken British value, whiteness. One of the byproducts of whiteness is the way it shapes practice. What is considered appropriate or professional, which is outlined, also shapes the requirements for funding and associated value judgments. Hall's comments on the whiteness of the heritage sector relates not only to the collections themselves held within archives, museums and libraries, but obviously also to the staff who handle and process these collections and, as I said, inhabit so much of our own professional practice and how we understand our role. This whiteness in the sector has far-reaching consequences ranging from accession and appraisal to cataloguing and interpretation and in Hall's speech he also spoke of the real difficulties associated with ensuring change within the sector which can be taken even further if we grapple with the root causes and structuring of whiteness which is the codification of racial hierarchies that fueled colonialism. In 2018 to 2019 I wrote an article entitled Reclaiming History, in which I began to think about the colonial bases of archival theory and management. 
For my research, I've been particularly interested in the ways in which these questions of whiteness and professionalism have con contributed to discussions about what type of material is deemed to not only be valuable in, this, in an historic sense, but also what type of physical material is deemed valuable. I have also been lured by the attempt to fix the ideas and alter of alternative lineages to seek the first or the new, but these are in many ways within the logic of the coding system of binaries and boundaries, which we are often clear, which we clearly owe much to the author cited Jenkinson. How, in writing this article, I attempted to think about the alternative theoretical gene genealogies of archival thought and practice through the work of Arturo, um, also known as Arthur Schomburg whose library and archival collections form the basis of the Schomburg Centre, which is now part of the New York Public Library System. Arturo Alfonso Schomburg was a Puerto Rican-born black scholar who devoted his life to collecting material on black history and culture. Schomburg acted as the first curator for what was the New York Library's um, Division of Negro Literature, History and Prints in Harlem from 1932 until his death in 1938, and after donating his large collection of material to the, um, to the library in 1926. And the building was renamed after him to the Schomburg Center in 1940. I use Schomburg to analyze the history of collecting within the broader Pan-African tradition and the different intellectual frameworks that speak to the, to the processes and theory of archive building, independent of European theory, but clearly in discussion with it. As a migrant from the Spanish-speaking speaking Caribbean to Harlem, New York, at a time of fast shifting demographic changes, Schomburg's biography offered me a key insight into the workings of the diaspora and Pan-Africanism. At the center of the intellectual networks in Harlem, Schomburg was also at the center of the development of the Harlem, of the Harlem Renaissance, and through his friendship with African-American philosopher Alan Locke, he articulated his ideas about historical recovery, a key aspect of Pan-African thought. Writing in Locke's New Negro Anthology, Schomburg described his approach to collecting in um, an article called The Negro Digs Up His Past as working to, quote, what restore what slavery took away, for it is the social damage of slavery that the present generation must repair and offset, end quote. For Schomburg, it is, was the collection of material, such as documentary evidence of black achievement, in addition to publishing, that he thought would undo the damage of enslavement. Through the building of his archive, Schomburg wanted to provide evidence of historical continuity, and more importantly, he articulated a theory of recovery and, the, and a process by which to undertake it, rather than the English and European approach and idea of neutrality and passivity passivity, so he was very much involved in that process. Through his connections to the Harlem Renaissance and the Garvey movement, Schomburg's articulation of the Pan-African ideology of historical recovery would then find their legacies in several political and cultural movements, including Negritude, which emerged in the Francophone Caribbean through the work of César, Leopold Senghor, and Franz Fanon, and later in the Black Power movement and the rise of Rastafari in Jamaica and Britain. However, through this writing this, this this talk today and has been illustrated in my article, it became clear that in order to decenter Jenkinson, I have spent a vast amount of time recounting and figuring him back into the piece. Much of this frustration has been born in many ways to the expectations and practice of the academic exercises of writing, and particularly the politics of citation. In order to make my point and to make it legible within archival discourses, I still needed to create a sense of legibility to bring the people to where I was but through the European center of Jenkinson. As highlighted by Derrida, Ramirez and Paul, this I think is a fundamental difficulty in any attempt to decolonize a sector. In order to create legibility, we are conditioned and continue to need to orient ourselves this way. This of course is not a new intervention and is dealt with by Sarah Ahmed in her work on the role of whiteness and particularly the use and role of diversity within institutions. Aside from these theoretical underpinnings of some issues of decolonization, I'm now going to touch to turn to touch on some of the practical implications of colonial thinking within the sector. Much of my work has been thinking about the continued physical impact of colonization across the world, particularly the effects of the climate crisis, and as Gada urges, that we the need to go beyond our immediate context. To return to my fundamental argument, to truly turn to the colonial would mean an engagement with and potential destruction, destruction of many of the ways in which we fundamentally understand the role of archive and archival theory. For our colleagues in the sector outside of Europe, there has been the growing use of land acknowledgements, recognize the, the violence of colonization and the forcible removement, the forcible removement, removal of people from their ancestral lands through acts of genocide and that later forced them into reservation, reserve, segregated houses and ghettos. The colonial gaze that rendered the indigenous and Aboriginal peoples both invisible and expendable has obviously permeated our collecting practices that have created gaps and silences. 
alongside the extractivism of colonialism, including the processes of transatlantic slave trade that kidnapped Africans into the Caribbean and to the Caribbean and the Americas to cultivate other transplanted crops for the benefit of the plantation economies, through to the scramble for Africa and the colonization of the Pacific and Australia for oil, gas, and precious metals, this need for overconsumption is still present. Recently, there has been pushback from the sector in terms of how about thinking about how we see funding from oil and gas conglomerates, but there is still much work to be undertaken to engage with the extent to which we need to remove ourselves from this web of capital, sometimes secretive and, and opaque, that is a legacy of these processes, but also still deeply intertwined whilst active mining and destruction of the environment is still taking place. Clearly, while some organizations and companies are currently looking into the legacy of transatlantic slave trade on their financial development and using the language of reparations, I personally cannot take them seriously if they are still engaged in supporting contemporary mining operations that are destroying the planet and keeping people from their ancestral lands. True decolonization would clearly mean a complete break with these income streams, and again, something which might seem insurmountable at the moment. I've also had some additional percolating thoughts about the very nature of collecting. Obviously, there has been many interesting interventions into grappling with the colonial obsession with collection and collecting objects, particularly in the case of ethnographic museums and subsequent calls for restitution. But I've been also thinking about the archival urge to continue to collect. Whilst a lot of remedies to colonial collecting as a, correct, as a corrective, including black cultural archives, it relies on the logic of more is more. To fill the gaps and absences, we need to continue to collect with the necessary impacts of the need to create more space and build more stores. As already outlined, much of this is tied to the fundamental archival impetus to collect and control the frame of collections, particularly through our focus on cataloging as a means of exerting physical and intellectual control over our holdings. Whilst there are clear and obvious reasons and rationales for doing so, particularly within our, within our colonial frameworks, we also need to think outside of these methods and, me and mechanisms of control to embrace the colonial praxis. The move to the digital also gives us a potential opportunity to save everything. And again, so whilst there have been many important interventions in thinking through the dangers of the big data model, the obvious issue here, again, is the physical impact. As we probably already know, and all know, the digital has a physical impact somewhere. From, from the mining, as mentioned, of precious metals needed to build our devices, to the space needed for server farms and the ongoing energy requirements, the legacies of climate change and the climate crisis does not affect all countries equally, and it will again be those former colonized countries in the global south that will continue to be disproportionately impacted <clears throat> by our decisions made here. On the related issues of the physical and digital collecting, I also wanted to think briefly about the legal, legal frameworks, particularly of copyright. Clearly copyright is another legacy of the logic of ownership, and I'm well aware of protection of the protection that copyright affords to creators. But I'm interested in the tension and of the desire to share knowledge on copyright requirements to close these down. I'm thinking about the use of copyright in older collections where copyright is assigned during the digitiz is assigned during the digitization process, and specifically the use and attribution of copyright onto colonial collections when the question of ownership is already particularly contested. Alongside this, there's also the presence of paywalls, but I'll leave this sign being. To think about ownership in a truly decolonial way, there's clearly a lot of work to do to think about the protection of people's intellectual and moral, moral property, but even then how we think about property needs to be um, approached against the need to give access. For collections and collecting practices alongside copyright and ownership, there's a clear question of deposit and ownership, and within our current legal agreements, taking legal ownership of collections also makes sense. But how do we imagine our role in terms of donors and our collections that don't necessarily fall back on these ideas of ownership? Sorry. On the flip side, as argued by Daniela Augustino in her article, Archival Encounters, rethinking access and care, or in her article, Archival Encounters, rethinking access and care in digital colonial archives, the move towards more open access is also wrought with the dangers of colonial thinking. Continuing with the theme of consumption and control, Augustino highlights the dangers of recirculating and reinscribing harm and trauma through the circulation of digitized colonial materials that continue to remove personhood and agency from colonial peoples. Finally, extending this discussion about space and power, the second point I wanted to make in relation to the Master's House Space Archives in UCL, it sounds like I've got a beef against UCL, I really don't, um, is the role of Bentham and the development of the reading, of reading room practice. For those of you who are unaware, um, the corpse of Bentham, known as his, his auto icon, is um, on display at the new student centre. Previously, Bentham's body was on display in the South Voices of the Wilkinson's building, Wilkins building, 
And for those of you who know UCL, so it's the big white one in the middle, where I walked past every time I was on campus. I mentioned this in relation, I mentioned this relationship between Bentham and UCL, as there has been some research on the role of Bentham's ideas on, of surveillance and the panopticon and the development of reading rooms. Some archival scholars, such as Jarrett Drake, have pushed this focus on surveillance when people thinking about the role of archives in, and reading rooms in terms of prisons and the carceral system that continues to place boundaries and borders on who is physically allowed access and how people experience these systems, as well as the broader conversations about power, boundaries and surveillance. However, I don't want to leave with the sense that all is lost. As I hope has become clear, I'm certainly not arguing, arguing against true attempts into colonizing our practice, and I've been attempting to engage with decolonial frameworks to help further my thinking. Key to some of this, um, of this has been the work of Christina Sharp on what she describes as the wake. Sharp describes the difficulties of working within structures that even as we attempt to disrupt them, they continue to do violence, so much of what I've already been discussing. Um, Sharp suggests that living and working in the wake is a way of living with and paying attention to colonialism and the effects of migration. By paying attention to the wake, we may be in a better position to understand and start to undo the thickness. To think about how we can engage with a colonial archive, along with Sharp, they've been engaging particularly with the work of Sadia Hartman in terms of dealing with what is lost, the debris of Achille and Bembe, and as Marissa Fuentes and Colony argue, that what is the failure of the archive. While it is still important to take the starting point that colonial archives haven't failed within their own terms as the instruments of government and control, I take these principles in Hartman's work on critical population as different tools towards the colonial processes. It may also be possible to think of these principles of debris and loss as potential correctives and not necessarily creating new archives within the process of consumption and control as outline, but more metaphorical ways of thinking about knowledge and power and thinking differently about what is needed by different communities. I see some of these approaches within the principle of Sankofa, a return to what is lost and the idea of using the reparative framework to think about the importance of archives, time and liberation. During my thesis, I predominantly considered Sankofa and the reparative as part of what Sharp would consider as her wake work, dealing with our colonial present that in many ways is still in conversation with colonialism, but that also seeks to disrupt what is knowable and imaginable. The work of Sankofa also seeks to disrupt the idea of a linear colonial time, and again, could offer new ways of thinking expansively about what we do, how and why we do it. However, as we are still living with colonialism, I wonder about the extent to which we are truly able to imagine freely and expensively as we can only really imagine with the material that we, we already have and know. It is clear that so much of our theory and practice is derived from colonial logics and colonial thinking, which is why I start from the question of the extent to which our sector can be decolonized. Not because, as I said, I don't see the necessity of decolonization, but as our sector itself is a colonial construct, a colonial construct I think about what would be left. If it means that there would be a wholesale destruction rebuilding everything that we know, then I guess so be it. As I have hopefully made clear throughout this talk, I do hope that at some point we can reach a, reach a space in which the sector truly engages with a radical break that decolonial processes call for. However, however as I've made clear, I remain skeptical about the use of the term decolonial when, may, when we may in fact be talking about diversity or anti-racism. Whilst ensuring diverse anti-racist and safe spaces are vital, I continue to be cautious about true decolonization. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Now let's get my video on. Oh, there you go. Gosh, that was a lot. <laughs> well done. Thank you very much. And thank you for that, that half hour of, of, of learning. It was I, I really appreciate to be able to stop and to listen to what you had to say. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions, do put them up in the Q&A or um, in, in the chat, but the Q&A would be better. It's easier to manage. Um, uh, the things that, whilst people are doing that, the things that stuck with me is the... The, the more is more around collecting in relation to collecting and also the, the conflicts around copyright. I mean, I, I knew, but it's really, it's really good to hear it articulated in the way that you did. I've got, I've got a little question, um, but it, I'm afraid it's related to UCL. So I'll, I'll try and frame it in a way that isn't UCL bastard. You know what, as I say, I, I want to make it clear. Yeah, I love UCL. Yeah. Because I was there a lot of times to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it did. It did have a eugenics department, and it has got that that, that Bentham um, 
uh, whatever you called it. I can't remember what it's called. Oh, you, it's called the auto icon. Auto icon, of course, yeah. So I just wondered, whilst you were there, because you were there a while, did you see a shifting or, or a nuance around um, decolonization work in, in that department um, or uh, diversity anti-racial work from it just being a thing to it being a process or, or a framework? Did you see any shift? Um, yes and no. I think, as I, as, I, as, as I keep saying in my talk, I think sometimes and where I'm trying to come from is that the issue is not, good work being undertaken mm. is the use of the frame decolonization mm. so yeah. there has there is and has been some amazing work at ucl particularly in, in information studies around grappling with um anti-racist and kind of commu commu community centered archives but again I, i'm not certain it's decolonial and i'm not certain that at the way that universities are structured that any or most work that comes out of universities can be truly de decolonial until as i say all those kind of ripples, all that kind of external stuff is also dealt with. So it's hard to kind of practice decolonization in an institution which is still funded and kind of has networks and issues around kind of within these kind of colonial frameworks. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> you might see a comment, there's a comment in the chat about your lectures were very good and um, your comments provoked a lot of th thought while I was there. So that's someone who obviously attended your lectures when you're at UCL. I do have a question for you. Um, uh, okay, does abolition include? Does abolition include the archive? If so, how and what's the alternative? This is a big one. <laughs> um, yes, it does. And you know, as I said, so much of what we do and what we know historically comes from the archive. Uh, but as I said, I I don't know what comes after. Um, as I say, it, it might be a case of starting from scratch and whether we're ready to do that, I don't know. And, you know, I know I spent a lot of time with Derrida, but I think that it is so much about what we, how we think and what we think is so kind of embodied in the archive, embodied in our knowledge structures that how one goes outside of that. But I mean, I, I am imprisoned in English. And so I think, you know, part of a decolonial framework would be to engage with languages and thinkers outside of English, outside of Western kind of um, European languages to kind of really think about how our concepts can be shaped by different kind of thought structures, if that makes sense. Yeah. Like, you know, our, our language structures how we think. And so different languages might help us also if I'm going to think outside of what we really know. Yeah. Okay, um, there are a few comments about uh, your citations. So I think your citations went down really well. So do I, I think it would be nice to get the, the full citation on, on them. Um, and I've got another question for you. Uh, so brilliant paper, thank you, Hannah. There's lots of brilliant going up in the chat so you don't have to read it. Uh, very interesting points about ownership. In the absence of true deco de decoloniality, do you think it might be about a different prioritization, i.e., prioritizing regarding cultural sensitivity ownership over traditional concerns like copyright. Definitely. And um, if on, on the kind of work of citations, there's a, a, a wonderful um, academic called Kimberly Christensen, who works with Aboriginal um, and Native um, American structures and has kind of put together um, a cataloging process um, Catherine system called Mukatu. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, that kind of work has already been going on. And I think, yes, definitely, as I say, thinking about what is needed by communities rather than what we, within sure. the kind of a legal framework, need yeah, yeah. Within, our, within our systems, I think is, is, is a point to start with kind of asking people, you know, what, what do you need how, and how can we help rather than saying, well, actually, no. I mean, I was going to include a... Uh, a case of a museum who had been approached by um, a black community group to use materials related to enslavement um, that the museum had digitized and had put copyright ownership on and was in charging the community um, hundreds of pounds to use that um, material. So yeah, kind of moving towards decolonization would be to kind of think outside of our, our policies and our kind of practices to kind of really understand how some of that continues to do harm. So how, you know, the material was about enslaved people and asking their um, 
potential what are we, what is now uh uh not ancestors the opposite of ancestors uh family <laughs> to pay for that material um yeah i think is is obviously really problematic descendants yes thank you Sorry. descendants <laughs> So are you able to bring any of this thinking and this work into the Black Cultural Archives and the work that you do in the Black Cultural Archives? Um, I'm trying to. So um, particularly around the digital, we're really, really thinking about access and ownership and trying to not put things behind paywalls, not try and make things as open access as possible. And one of the things that we try to do is also yeah, work with our donors to try and work out what is how they want to continue to work because i mean black cultural archives has a predominantly 20th century archive so quite yeah. a lot of our owners on depositors are still very much alive and with us and so rather than taking material kind of the donation of material as the end point mm -hmm. kind of start it as the beginning point and the conversation about how material is used how we use it how it might be used by other institutions obviously that's a very long process it's quite a lot of time it works for bca because we don't have you know as yeah. many collections as so yeah, yeah. large um, as somewhere like the national archives or the british library um but yeah so very much kind of trying to be mindful about why material is being donated to us and how it's being used but ensuring that it's being done with the kind of community or at least the donors in mind rather than like thinking about it in like oh well this is how i was taught to do yeah Absolutely, absolutely. That's good to hear. Um, I have another question for you. Okay, you mentioned that you often engage with different decolonial frameworks. Is there a framework or an approach that you found useful in your practice? So back to practice again. Um, particularly, yeah, as I mentioned, um, Christina Sharp's work. So um, she's an African American like a literary scholar. Um, and so she talks about the idea of the wake or wake work. Um, I think the book's called on being in the wake and so really kind of starting from the point of understanding and trying to grapple with the legacy so quite a lot of my research is about trying to unpick and untangle I guess organizational biographies so how have organizations developed how do they get how have they got into where they are and how do we kind of continue to engage with that because I think sometimes we don't really whilst we may know the history of our organization we might not necessarily be kind of truly um grapple with that so um how we take that as a, again take that as a starting point but also don't take it as like has to be all the all the time so you know an organization has a an arc but you know just because it's been done before or this is how we used to do it this is how we have to do it. so you know christina sharp and as i mentioned um sadia hartman and her ideas around critical population so the article that i'm particularly influenced by is called Venus and Two Acts and it was published in a journal called Small Acts. Small Acts A X E. Okay. Um, not small acts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, and so she just kind of talks about a lot about the colonial archive, a lot about how we just we, some of the things we just can't know, but also how we can kind of think about our imagination and um, the imaginary as a way, not necessarily as a, as a corrective, as I said, but Hopefully not in a way of like, well, we need to collect more stuff, but also how do we engage, I guess, with the abscesses that doesn't lead to having to kind of create more and more stuff and collect more and more things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Lovely. I don't know if you can see that chat, but everybody, there's quite a number of people putting references into the stuff that you're referencing, which is, which is, I guess, when you talk to librarians and archivists, that's what they, that's what they're going to gonna do. But that's great. Alice is actually doing some research into the into our organisation and how our organisation was set up um, and how that influences some of the collections that we have. Um, OK, so she's interested in the theoretical notion of recovery in archival work. So you mentioned this was a theory developed by Schomburg and it's been applied in a range of black led or pan-African archive and heritage settings. Do you have any thoughts on how recovery might be a guiding principle for university archives, which are predominantly um, white led? Um, yes. So, as I said, um, yes and no. So, um, as I mentioned, the idea of recovery is very much within a pan-African um, notion and it kind of pan-African theories and it takes starting point 
of the of the rupture that the transatlantic slave trade has wrought, particularly on black communities across across the world, that we just for those who are descended Afro descended, that there was just some there's just nothing we, else that can be knowable outside of that, and so um, the art, kind of Schomburg's articulation of it was that the material exists material that exists to kind of speak to um, black agency and black presence, particularly in a kind of society that's constantly telling you that you don't exist or misrepresenting um, one's history. But as I said, part of that is within the kind of logics of colonialism. So mm -hmm. it is in conversation with collecting and collecting practices, which is why not that I don't not that I don't think it's really important. It's a very important anti-racist kind of struggle, but I'm still kind of thinking through about how that would work as in a decolonial kind of framework where we might not we might not necessarily need to collect and, and institutions may not necessarily need to exist anymore. I don't know what that looks like. So, um, but yes, I think for universities and recovery is a really um, can be a really helpful process. But as again, kind of working with the communities closely with whom the material that you're trying to recover and what is what what works for them um, yeah. rather than what the university thinks or what yeah. you know this is I mean this none of this is like new thoughts that I've had you know people working in um, decolonization in diversity work of endless endless articles about kind of how to do this practice but I think, I think that, that kind of is, is at least a starting point and then we can help you all just move towards what this kind of decolonial break would look like okay Okay, that's uh, you, well. Alice, who asked that question, now wants to speak more with you, but I'll let you do that outside of here. Um, okay, I've got one last question from um, David Prosser, uh, uh, who is interested in an early point that you made about the responsibility of colonial archives to fix their own problems, which I think is what we've just been talking about. Um, so, agree, but how can they ensure they don't fall into the same old decolonial? We know the best ways of thinking. So, continuing with a colonial mindset. Um, <laughs> as I said that's in a way the yeah, yeah it's the big question isn't it it's the uh that is the question and that's the kind of issue with kind of decolonization as, as it as it stands is that yeah. if, we, if we want to get into the deep theory about it it's like how do you go outside of what you already know yeah. but I mean there's, there's actually a really great piece that I read by a, an academic called Temi Odomusu which is on her website. And it's, again, thinking about decolonization as, as, a, as a praxis, as a framework, rather as a thing we get to. Yeah. Um, she's listed like yeah. 10 things, yeah. that, like yeah. 10 things that you can start doing. And part of it is yes. you know, kind of history, reading, coming to where people are, trying to kind of move outside of some of these binaries, this kind of binary thinking that we're um, engaged with, basically trying to be a nice person. But, you know, for niceness is kind of um, understood, uh, being generous with your time, all those kind of things are, are kind of parts of these kind of decolonial. Um, I can try and find it, if we have time, super quickly to kind of paste in the chat. Hopefully it will be in my recent searches. Okay, so this is about stakeholder groups and advisory groups and how, how can they help? <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's difficult, isn't it, with um, representation? But um, have you got any thoughts about how they might be able to help the process? Yeah, so we, um, we recently, you know, you asked me about how do I kind of try and mm -hmm. increase some of this in BCA. So we've recently finished a um, Welcome Trust funded project to catalog some material relating to a mental health activist. And mm -hmm. part of the kind of key aspects of that was to create a working group, not only with the donor, but um, other archivists and people working both within the mental health field and those who have experience of mental health and um, poor mental health. And um, as all these things, it's kind of bringing people in from the beginning. So trying to find ways to actually have allow them to meaningfully shape the project. You know, as I said, this is not, this is not new, but um, getting people in from the ground, recognizing and supporting them. So as far as possible, if you can pay people or find some ways of getting people onto the payroll so that their, their expertise and their time is yeah. financially contributed but also kind of <laughs> taken on board in, in yeah. the processes as well um and just talking to I think just talking to people and trying to work out how within your institution you can you can 
can do that work because it is you know one of the main issues particularly around diversity is being piecemeal or tokenistic kind of involvement and also being prepared for people to highlight flaws and not get to, as hard as one can not get defensive about it because you know people are particularly if people are engaging with you they, they, they want to help so kind of being able to kind of take that on board and find ways of, of enacting that change because people keep telling you the same thing nothing changes then you're kind of in that circle so yeah paying yeah. people bringing them in from the ground and taking on board what they have to say I think would be the kind of main topics Sounds like a fabulous place to stop, actually. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Hannah. You, there's a lot of love for your talk and celebration about your talk in, in the chat. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Um, I can be found online. <laughs>